Hello and welcome back to 90 Day Dental, day 33. We're starting a brand new section today on perio. And over the next week or so, we're going to be tackling a number of uh, topics, but we're going to start with the most important one, which is the new UK perio classification. And it's going to be covered by none other than Ian Dunn. Take it away. Hi everybody, I hope this finds you all safe and well at this really difficult, challenging time. Uh, we've got quite a lot to get through in a very short space of time. So we'll get on with the new classification presentation, otherwise known as to be or not to be. Hopefully you all get that gag. So there's two papers that I'd encourage you to have a look at off the back of today's presentation. One is Phil Hour's dental update paper, which is the new classification system for periodontal and peri-implant diseases. Really easy to read paper that looks at the big differences between the old classification and the new classification. And I'd also encourage you to look at the original BDJ paper from 20, January 2019 uh, that looks at uh, or, or was the BSP's implementation of the 2017 workshop. We need to do a little bit of background. When we think about making a diagnosis, we are identifying the nature of an illness or a problem through the examination of the signs and symptoms that are presented in front of us. We do our, our assessment, we do our special tests, and we come up with our diagnosis. And it's important that bit because what they produced in the World Workshop was a classification system, and the classification is not the same as a diagnosis. A diagnosis, it puts a bit more meat on the bones. And so, you know, a classification is historical. It tells you nothing about the current disease status, whereas a diagnosis tells us more. It tells us whether lots of teeth are affected or some of the teeth are affected. It tells us whether uh, the disease is active or inactive, and that's particularly important for our disease that we're talking about. And we don't treat patients on the basis of a classification. We treat them on the back of a comprehensive diagnosis that is specific to their clinical situation. And so, you know, an example of this would be periodontitis being a classification, but a diagnosis telling us more about localized or generalized, mild, moderate or severe, chronic or aggressive periodontitis, and more of that to come later on. The other thing with a diagnosis is a diagnosis drives a comprehensive treatment plan, and we can't go into treatment planning in this very short presentation, but we shouldn't treat patients without a comprehensive diagnosis. The other thing that's important about a diagnosis is that a diagnosis prevents litigation. And so 75% of perio cases that DDU looked at um, between 20, uh, 2008 and 2012 75% of them were down to failure to diagnose and adequately treat periodontitis. So a diagnosis is not just clinically important to drive our treatment planning, uh, but it's really important to prevent uh, future litigation. So bef before we get into the new classification, I think it's just worth just looking at the old classification just for a minute. With the old classification, uh, we had this sort of Ron Seal diagnosis. It did what it said on the tin. Uh, and it was particularly good. I think we liked it. It's been around for nearly 20 years. And one of the big things that most of us liked about it was that we could talk about these two different disease categories, chronic and aggressive periodontitis. Both could be either localized or generalized. Um, and one of the nice things was that we as specialist periodontists could say to general practitioners and, and hygienists and therapists that you guys should be treating the chronic you should be referring the aggressive and if they're not if the chronic doesn't respond to treatment then yeah we'll absolutely help out with those cases as well but there was this sort of really nice delineation between the two conditions and you'll see in a minute that one of the one of the new classification flaws is that this delineation has gone for uh, one reason or another but because of this i mean with this new classification it shouldn't change the type of patient that you treat and it equally shouldn't change the type of patient you refer what you referred before you should still refer now and what you would have treated before you should still treat now that really hasn't changed um, you'll remember that the localized and generalized was based on number of sites affected or percentage of sites affected and if it was less than 30 percent of sites affected then it was localized and more than 30 percent of sites affected it was generalized 
because it's so important to get that that referral bit right it's worth just looking at the the old classification just for a minute because aggressive really should be referred on to a periodontist at a very early stage and when we're looking at is it is it old-fashioned chronic or is it old-fashioned aggressive then we look at things like the genetic basis so we get a stronger family history with aggressive disease these patients tend to be younger they tend to have very good oral hygiene uh, they tend or they, they, they don't always have any significant risk factors and the damage that we see is disproportionate to both their age and their oral hygiene. This young girl is only 21 in this photo uh, and they are her clinical radiographs from the day that she presented. A really devastating disease. So we see this very fast breakdown and we used to see these and we do see these vertical bone defects. You compare that to chronic and it's just the opposite. Uh, it's less obviously genetic, the patients tend to be older, the disease is often commensurate with their hygiene uh, and they often compound that with risk factors and it tends to be slow. So we get these patients who get into their 60s uh, and yes they've had a fairly poor oral hygiene, yes they might have lost the odd tooth but they don't have the rapid bone destruction that our young 21 year old has. And so it's always worth having this old system in the back of our mind because we currently don't have uh, a, a way of using the new classification to say well you treat this and we should treat that so have this in the back of your mind don't forget it the workshop that produced this classification system was the world workshop in 2017 and it was a truly global event the american academy of periodontology uh, met with the european federation of periodontology together with australian south africans um, people from the far east china singapore and they had this global workshop and they produced this consensus report. And it's, it's fair to be said that uh, this is a really huge body of work and the vast majority of it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and we can translate this into practice or into research. One of the things that we found that they, they got um, or that was difficult was to translate some of the periodontitis section into general practice and more of that in a second. The headlines that came out of the workshop were that aggressive periodontitis was no longer recognized as a separate disease entity. And this came as a bit of a surprise to, to most of us because we see clinically massively different patterns of disease with what we used to call chronic and aggressive periodontitis. But now what they're saying based on one piece of research is that uh, aggressive periodontitis and chronic periodontitis are just different ends of the same disease uh, spectrum. They've brought back the concept of molar incisor relationships. So those of you who have been around long enough will remember localized juvenile periodontitis where it affected the, the first molars and the uh, anterior teeth. Well, they've now brought that back. So we've now got either localized or generalized or molar incisor relationships. The Armitage system had um, eight categories. We've now gone down to three. So we've got periodontitis, necrotizing periodontitis, and periodontitis as a manifestation of systemic disease. Um, and that I'm quite comfortable with. The periodontitis, now we should talk about staging and grading, as I'm sure many of you will know. And I know that many people found it difficult to initially get their head around, but staging is really looking at how much damage has been done. Uh, so that's basically the same as mild, moderate or severe. And grading looks at how fast the disease is progressing. And that effectively is what we used to do with chronic and aggressive periodontitis. So these things are massively different, um, but it's just about learning the terminology and applying the rules to come up with your diagnostic statement. What they showed us in the World Workshop is this table. This is the table that was presented to us in Amsterdam. Uh, this is the staging table. So we're supposed to go through this table and look for the different features to plug in to decide how severe the periodontal disease is. And for a couple of reasons that we can go on to in a minute, you'll see that we struggle to translate this into the UK environment. Um, first things that we looked at is that one on the top line, incidental clinical attachment loss. We don't tend to measure incidental clinical attachment loss in UK perio. It's a great research tool, but it's not something that we ask uh, general practitioners to do. Uh, we ask for you to measure pockets and bleeding. So there's, there's a few reasons why we were going to struggle to get this to work in the UK setting. The grading, this is the, the, the rate of progression. 
again, there's a few things here that don't quite translate into general practice. The first thing being that if you look at this radiographic bone loss uh, to determine how fast the disease is going, then you had to have historical information about a patient to be able to make your grading uh, assessment. And we know that uh, with a new patient, we're obviously not gonna have that information. So, so we just felt in the UK that this was a little bit challenging to implement in the UK setting. There's a few things that I do really like. So the percentage bone loss to age thing is a really, really useful tool. Although you'll see in a minute, the BSP have changed the grade boundaries uh, to be a little bit more, or a little bit less sensitive. So we, we listened to the presentation in, in, at Amsterdam in, in the Euro Perio, and off the back of it, when we came back to the UK, the BSP decided that we needed to have an implementation document to talk about how we could put this classification into the UK setting. And I don't think that's unreasonable because uh, I think you know, for us to expect a world classification to be able to be plugged into every different uh, country setting, both in terms of, um, I suppose, healthcare provision, insurance-based uh, dentistry, socioeconomic uh, differences from different countries, it was never going to be something that could just be plug and played into each uh, country's dentistry system. So the BSP came up with something that was going to be usable in UK general practice. It's caused a little bit of trouble because this is effectively Brexit. It's the BSP going against the rest of the world, uh, which is quite topical, or it was quite topical prior to coronavirus when we were exiting uh, uh, Europe. But it has made us a little bit unpopular. Um, but I think at least we've got a workable system that works in general practice. I hope you'll agree. Uh, albeit I showed you very quickly, the two tables that I did show were particularly complicated uh, and for you to use that day to day in your general practice I think would have been particularly onerous. So what the BSP came up with was a staging and grading system of our own and what you'll see here is that staging and grading table. We've kept the stages 1, 2, 3 and 4 and we've kept the grades A, B and C so it's in line with the world workshops um, findings and presentations. What you're supposed to do is you do your radiographic assessment as is appropriate based on your screening and, and your clinical findings. And then you're supposed to go to the worst affected site, so the worst affected tooth, and look at where is the bone loss in relation to that root length. If you've got mild disease and you've only got uh, a set of bite wings, then you are almost certainly gonna be diagnosing stage one mild disease, because that is disease that is only up to two millimeters of bone loss um, beyond its normal position. If you've got anything more significant than that, you are almost certainly gonna have a periapical x-ray. And at that point, you can decide whether the bone loss is in the coronal third, the mid third, or the apical third. And it really is that simple. You find the worst affected tooth and you decide based on your x-ray if the bone is in the coronal, mid or apical third and that makes it stage two, stage three or stage four. We then have to decide whether it's localised or generalised and that hasn't changed from the old classification and now we've got this new old concept of molar incisor pattern. So hopefully you'll agree that staging is relatively simple. Where's the bone on the worst affected tooth based in terms of the, the length of the root of that tooth. Really simple. We're going to go through a case in a second. The grading is slightly different. Grading is a little bit more difficult to explain and hopefully I'll do it justice in the next couple of slides. We've got these three grades, A, B and C, otherwise known as slow, moderate or rapid. And you'll see, and those of you who are paying attention will see that the grade boundaries that we've used are just ever so slightly different to the ones picked in the World Workshop. So the World Workshop went with the ones on the left and the BSP have gone with the ones in the middle. And the reason we changed it was that the, the, the World Workshop version just seems to not sensitive, or sorry, too sensitive enough um, when going from grade A to grade B. So if you were a 60 year old patient in the World Workshop classification system, and you had lost more than 15% of the bone around that tooth, you were telling the patients they'd now gone from slow disease to moderate at only 15%. If you, would, if you had an 80 year old patient and they had more than 20% of bone loss, you were telling that patient they'd gone from slow to moderately progressing disease. 
and it just felt a little bit too sensitive in terms of that great boundary. And so the BSP changed it and they went with this great boundary where I hope you'll agree it just feels a little bit more appropriate because now your 60 year old patient doesn't move from the slow to moderate progressing disease until they've hit 30% bone loss. They don't move from the um, moderate to fast progressing disease until they've lost 60% of their bone loss. Can you hear those numbers 60, 30, 60, 60? Suddenly the maths on this becomes significantly easier than the world workshop and the grade boundary changes feel a little bit more appropriate. So what you've got to remember with uh, the grading system is you've got to work out one of two, two of three things. Is it an A? And it's an A if the bone loss is slow and it's slow if the maximum bone loss at the worst affected site is less than half the patient's age. So a 60 year old patient, if the worst site is less than 30% bone loss, it's an A. An 80 year old, less than 40%. If for a C, which is the rapid disease, if the maximum bone loss is greater than the patient's age, then they're a C. So A is less than half the patient's age, and C is more than their age. If it's not an A, and if it's not a C, then it's a B. And it is really, again, that simple. So there's just a few very basic rules for you to learn. Last bit before we move on, we've now got this concept of stable, in remission, or unstable. Stable is where we have a mouthful of shallow pockets and a bleeding score, bleeding on probing score of less than 10%. And that's quite a nice thing to be able to say to patients that, you know, we don't have to be at zero BOP to be telling a patient that we've got to the point where we can think about supportive care. The in remission is where we've got higher bleeding scores, but not necessarily higher pocket depths. And the unstable is where we've got deep pockets or significant bleeding. Now, it is worth noting that the BSP were very clear to say that they don't necessarily believe that every five or six millimeter pocket that doesn't bleed uh, is necessarily active disease. But when you meet a patient for the first time, if you had a five millimeter pocket, I'm sure you'd all want to do your very best to try and get that pocket depth down. Once you've got evidence that that pocket is not changing, at that point you can think differently once you've got that patient specific data. So ultimately, moving, moving forward from the 2018 initial presentation, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. We have to ask ourselves when we look at a case, is it periodontitis? If it is, then we've got to look at, is it localized, generalized or molar incisor? At that, once we've done that, we then have to look at the stage and the grade of the disease. And then we comment on the current health status of the patient. Is it stable, in remission or unstable? And then finally, we add in the risk factor profile that may be contributing to this patient's disease. And what you end up with is what initially looks like quite a wordy diagnostic statement, but it's not massively different from what we did historically, where we would have said generalized, uh, moderate, localized, severe, chronic periodontitis. We always did that with our old classification. You'll all be familiar with the, the BSP's flowcharts. If you haven't got one of these, you can request them from the BSP. They'll po post them out to you post COVID, uh, once everything goes back to normal. And these things are very useful at helping hold your hand through the classification uh, process. What I'd like to do in the last couple of minutes is just go through a case and talk you through the way I would think through this case. And if you follow this mantra, you will never go too far wrong when you're coming up with your own periodontal diagnostic statements. So here we've got a 42 year old male, a former heavy smoker with moderate to deep pockets and bleeding on probing. So the first question we ask ourselves, is this periodontitis? Because if it isn't, if we have false pocketing or whatever it may be, uh, then we don't have to worry about staging and grading. But very clearly we are looking at a periodontitis case. So we now have to go to our next level of questioning. So is it periodontitis? Yes. Now, is it localized, generalized or molar incisor? Quick rule of thumb, if all the molars are affected, then it's generalized. That's a, it's over 30% of sites affected. And I think you'll all agree that we can see a generalized bone loss, albeit different severities in different areas. So in this case, we've definitely got a generalized periodontitis. The next question, what stage is it? If you remember the staging, 
this is based on the uh, where the bone is in relation to the, the root length. And so I need to find the worst affected site. Lots of people, when we look at this case, look at the lower right first molar because there's a vacation involvement, but that isn't the greatest level of bone loss. It might be a periodontal challenge, but it's not the worst affected site. So I'm looking at the upper right second molar. Uh, and so for me, this is bone loss roughly in the mid third. And so it's a stage three. If you remember stage two was coronal third, stage three was mid third, stage four is apical third. So although it might feel that we're, we're sort of over-diagnosing the case because everywhere else isn't quite that bad, don't overthink it. This is the, these are the very simple rules to apply to come up with the, a new contemporary diagnostic statement. Once we've done staging, we now have to look at grading. So what grade is it? Well, we look at the worst affected site again. And in this case, I would say that bone loss is about 50% of the, of the root length. We've lost about 50% of the bone. We asked the patient's age, this patient's 42, and because the worst bone loss is more than the patient's age, this patient is a grade C. Now, we, the last, coming towards the end, we have to ask ourselves, is this stable? Is this patient in remission or is the patient unstable? And quite clearly in this case, we've got deep pockets and bleeding on probing. This patient is quite clearly periodontally unstable. Last bit, risk factor profile. Do we have any risk factors that have contributed to this case? Well, quite clearly in this case, we've got smoking as a risk factor. Even though that patient's recently stopped smoking, this patient very clearly has, uh, or the smoking has contributed to their risk factor profile. I suppose in theory, you could put something down about that marginal overhang on the lower right um, second molar. That would be a risk factor, and it would also fall, fall into your treatment plan for things to address. But what I hope you would come up with is a diagnostic statement that talks about this patient being a generalized periodontitis, 3C, currently unstable with smoking as a risk factor. I hope that's been helpful. There are more details available on our website, theperiocourses.co.uk. But if you can just remember that very simple mantra of is it perio or, or is it not, once it is, localized or generalized or molar incisor we then stage and grade the case we talk about stable unstable or in remission and we list our risk factors i look forward to catching up with you all again in a couple of sessions time uh, when we'll be covering uh, treatment and risk factor assessment a short but comprehensive analysis of the uh, the current paleo classification. I really thank Ian for this because it's not easy to do and to put it all into such a short space of time of 20 minutes when a lot of speakers would normally spend an entire day on this um, is, is a huge uh, benefit to us all. So really a heartfelt thank you for that and we'll be back again tomorrow for section two. Join us again. <laughs>